Hello, this is Richard Pears for Nextra TV, and I'm joined today by Andy Smith, and we are from Clearbank and the CTO. So it's exciting to have you with us today. Thank you, Richard. Nice to see you again. So um, what I wanted to really ask you, we've worked together for a long time now around Clearbank, and you know it's been a journey. But if you look back on it, can you kind of give us a little bit of a sense of you know what you set out to achieve on the technical side and where that's you know what you've learned along the way yeah um so on the technical side that was the that was right at the forefront of my mind when we started this journey so so when nick ogden sat down and said actually well, i want to build a clearing bank it's the first clearing bank in 250 years and i want to reimagine it in a new fashion you know what what did what did that mean you know you just have a conversation like, yeah i'd love to reimagine something but, but what do we actually mean by that but the biggest challenge for us was actually understanding the scale of it all. So we looked at um, reimagining banking as a service. So if I want to deliver something like agency banking services, or I want to deliver um, the deconstruction of a bank into individual microservices, and you can subscribe to those, what does that look like? How do I actually um, have our customers use it, leverage that platform? You know, the cloud technology was as you know, Richard, back in 2014, this conversation happened. 2015, cloud wasn't quite where it is where it is today. Um, we wanted to use horizontal scale because my, my challenge was one customer comes to us and it could be a thousand accounts. And banks usually say, well, okay, a thousand accounts, that's my, my customer base. So I've got 16 million accounts, that's my customer base. Challenge for us was actually our customers are other institutions. They're other banks. Mm -hmm. So two customers, might have 16 million and 100,000 accounts added together. And then somebody else turns up and, and customer number three brings another 5 million accounts. How do you scale with that without going back to your uh, sales team or your, or your client coverage team and say, sorry, we can't onboard that business because we haven't capacity planned enough. We need to go and buy more servers. I need more hardware. So right from day one, the whole concept was let's build microservices, let's deliver this as a subscription-based model, software model, SaaS model and deliver it 100% in the cloud, cloud native. And that was the real key driver for us. So, pe native. so people probably by now have understood that. I mean, I'm, I know I've been guilty of for a long time talking about elastic scale and all the rest of it, yeah. and people didn't know what I was talking about. But I think people get that now. When you get into the practical execution of that and saying, okay, so now I'm going to actually start to build out you know, my data layer, my application layer, I've got to do my security, my regulation aspects. When you start to get through from a decision about cloud, and move into the execution of those layers. What starts to go through your mind and what did you do? Yeah, so the first thing I wanted to do is actually instill what I call fundamentals. So we've got an engineering team that was growing very quickly, but you need to kind of have this kind of top overarching fundamentals mindset. So what are they? For us it was, okay, security has to be at the heart of everything we do. You know, at the end of the day, we're moving people's money, we're holding on to personal data, the liability that's assessed, uh, associated with personal data as well. So we need to be secure. The second thing is the availability of our services. If you're a subscription-based model and your customers are other institutions, and therefore it's their customer base that you're actually impacting as your customer or your customers, mm -hmm. you can't have this model where you have a maintenance window. You just can't have that, right? So we needed to have this concept of 100% availability or get as close to it as, as you could. And then you have the third one, which is performance. So I can't really have people logging into online banking or mobile banking and it goes so slow that it's not really working, right? You can say, okay, we're up, it's available, but it's, the performance is so mm. poor. So there were the three mindsets. So the engineering teams had to work around those three fundamentals, and they, they always have done and they always will do. Mm -hmm. The way that we then structured that was say the architects that we had, they actually set the framework around those three fundamentals. And we kind of operate in autonomous teams. Autonomous teams are really great for engineers, right? Because they're smart people, they yeah. want to be motivated. They're not problem solving, they're getting bored and essentially a board engineer yeah. doesn't code as well as they could do. So we, we kind of had this framework that they worked within and they're autonomously problem solving. That's really what we wanted to do. And because you've broken that down into microservices, then you're giving the ability for that autonom autonomous uh, activity to happen. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. So, so microservices for us are, are the lowest component. Right. So we kind of look and go, actually what we want to do is split those into domains. So we have a domain for operations, a domain for risk, a domain for finance, a domain for IT um, kind of fundamentals as well on its own. Uh, and within those domains, you'll have subdomains. And a subdomain could be sanction screening. 
sanction screening of transactions in flight. And that could be a subdomain. And within that, we have a bunch of microservices. Now, the reason we work in that way is so that if we look at, or step back a little bit, and say these individual microservices we want to iterate through, because actually we can make them a little bit more secure, or could there be some new technology that makes our availability better, or the performance uh, be improved? Can we iterate those individual microservices? Yes, we can. Can we actually take a whole domain out, though, like a Lego brick, mm, yeah. and bin that and start again with yeah. something new? I can now. And those domains aren't really um, tightly coupled. Those domains are really isolated. And they kind of work on their own. So, the so that's another of level of elasticity and scale, isn't it? We talk about just compute and storage and network, but actually you've got the agility there to, to flex your cap you know, the services, the products, the, the business model even. Yep. And that's, you're getting that as well here, is what and, I'm hearing. And, and for yeah. the non-techie people who are watching this sort of yeah. conversation here, the biggest benefit I, I kind of try and get over across to uh, other CIOs or COOs or CTOs uh, uh, more traditional banks yeah. is that where did your dev dollars go at the moment? How much of it is spent on your legacy systems and maintaining those? If you ask me what is legacy within ClearBank, the code base is legacy as if it's over two years old. Mm -hmm. So those domains, we're actually pulling them out and saying that is now a legacy component. We will upgrade that to make sure we have zero legacy and push that back in. And you know what? You'll be upgraded on a rolling upgrade. You won't actually have any maintenance for any downtime. You're just benefiting from our technology com completely moving with the times always forward. So when you kind of look at it, as some people say, I've got to have a kind of five-year plan of what this business is going to be. I've got a technically capacity plan and get the resources. But also I've got to think, I've got to know what my business is going to be in five years. Actually, you can be a bit more flexible now, can you? Is that is that true or am I sort of you know, you know swallowing the Kool-Aid a bit? Can no, you kind no, of pivot a little bit? You're, you're completely right. Yeah. So um, one of the things with banking as a service, I think one of the drivers that we originally had was how can you introduce the concept of failing fast to institutions or banks? Now, failing fast sounds yeah. horrific, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. But what I mean by that is actually your, your products and services. You know, if you want to launch a pilot, something that just goes to a niche number of customers, you don't want to invest a lot of time in consultancy services, understanding the market, um, designing the perfect product, that's trying to make the perfect fit. And by the time you get down to the engineers, they're following something that's quite prescribed because actually the amount of money and time you're taking to get there is quite considerable. Yeah. With banking as a service, you've got a subscription-based model. You can say, actually, I want that API there, that one there, that one there, that one there, and quickly I can tie together and form a product or a proposition. Yeah. And I end up with a customer experience and a customer outcome of that without all of those massive design phases and everything else. I'm leveraging the power of APIs and banking as a service. And that means you can put it with a, your customer base considerably earlier, yeah. get their feedback into that iterative loop, Exactly. You're going to find out straight away if it's going to fail because even if you have a, a small, small uh, number of people using it, let's say it's only a hundred of your customers, then, they're going to tell you what's wrong with it or what's yeah. right with it. So you can actually iterate through and say this product would fail as it is. Fail fast, so flexibility, right? flexibility, agility of business model and of technology. Yeah. Andy, we could talk about this for hours, but I think we'll do it again in another couple of series. I feel there's a lot more to come. Thanks so much for your time today. Nice talking to you. Cheers. Thanks, Andy.